What is karma? For a long time, people on your planet have misunderstood the actual meaning of that word. It is an ancient Sanskrit word, but most people on your planet have come to think of it as some sort of retribution, or punishment, or comeuppance, or just deserts, so to speak. Someone might do something to you that you feel hurt you, and then maybe later something happens to them that they don't find pleasant, and many people on your planet go, ah, karma, they got what they deserved. That is not the meaning of karma at all in its original form. The Sanskrit word karma simply means action. That's literally what the word means, action. And as we have said many times, actions are the language of physical reality. So this is understood in ancient times as the idea of the actions you take to rebalance yourself if you find that you have taken some action that brings you out of balance. Remember again, because the original definition of karma is action, which happens in the moment, then in a sense karma is synonymous with free will. You are making the free will choice to take the actions necessary to maintain balance in your life. That's what karma is. It's not something that accumulates from other times, other places. It is not retribution. It is not something that builds up and then gets you back. It is simply in the moment, the clear, free choice, free will recognition that you may be out of balance with who you prefer to be, and using the concept of action and karma and free will to bring yourself into balance by making choices that are more representative of who you prefer to be. That's all there is to it. It is very important and very crucial, which is why we're having this discussion today, for your society to really start to let go of these outdated and old-fashioned definitions of karma. They only anchor you into patterns and habits that aren't actually real. You are creating from a linear perspective a circumstance that doesn't actually exist in truth. The idea, again, is to bring everything back into present, to take responsibility, the ability to respond for the choices you have made and the consequences therefrom, and then decide, again, with your free will, your freedom to choose, what actions to take, what karma to use to bring yourself into the balance you say you prefer to exhibit in your life. This requires you to truly let go of these old-fashioned definitions and really pay attention to the new definition we are offering you as a suggestion so that you can be free to make the choices that are true for you and live in the present and take responsibility. And again, this doesn't mean it erases the idea that there are consequences for your choices. Of course there are. Again, what you put out is what you get back. But this doesn't have anything to do with what karma actually is. Karma, again, is simply the ability to take the actions necessary to bring yourself into balance if you believe you are out of balance. That's it. Free yourselves from the outdated definitions that anchor you to the concept of repeating patterns and the idea that you have to accumulate things and somehow discharge them in that way. The minute you choose to balance yourself, then you have used karma appropriately and nothing else accumulates until you are out of balance and again, you can balance yourself in that moment, in the present. That's karma. And that's it. Here is the true secret of the law of attraction. You have a core vibrational frequency. It is purely, uniquely you. It's a beacon. It's like a lighthouse. It shines, it radiates purely that signature frequency of your unique being. It never stops radiating that light, that frequency, that energy, never stops. Everything that is in alignment with that frequency is doing its utmost to come to you. Everything that is not aligned with that frequency is doing its utmost to get as far away from you as it possibly can. If the things that are aligned with that beacon aren't reaching you, it's not because you're not vibrating at the resonance that you need to attract it. It's because your definitions and beliefs are holding it away. If the things that are trying to get away from you can't get away from you, 
It's not because they're not trying. It's because you're holding on to them. So the true secret of the law of attraction is not how to learn to attract what you prefer. It's how to learn to let go of what you don't so that you can let in what is trying to get to you automatically by definition. That's the true secret, and that's why it's effortless. It's just about letting go and letting in. It's not about having to learn to do something you're not already doing. Make sense? Yes. Does this help? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. To your connection to the ancient extraterrestrials you refer to as the Anu, or Anunnaki. Being that, you contain their genetics because they were responsible for transforming Homo erectus, Homo habilis into Homo sapien with their own genes. Do you understand? I think so. There is a naturally evolved hominid on your planet. It grew naturally on your planet. And there were several branches of this hominid. The extraterrestrial beings that visited your world that were looking for helpers for a certain task actually decided to infuse some of their genetics into one branch of those naturally evolved hominids to create homo sapiens to be more like them so they could communicate with you and basically tell you what they needed you to do. Now, this was not necessarily an approved thing by all of the Anunnaki. And so eventually they were told they needed to leave and leave you to evolve on your own as a truly sentient species. Nevertheless, you are now awakening to the fact that you do contain some of that genetic material. Those markers are opening and you're experiencing more of the qualities that the Anunnaki themselves originally had. So you are revisiting the concept of Nibiru as a cycle, but the body, the physical body itself is nowhere near your planet at this point. Very good. Thank does you that so help much. You? Yes, it does. By the way, once again, a reminder. <clears throat> Had they not tinkered with your genetic material back then and created Homo sapien, the branch they did not tinker with went on to evolve into what you call Sasquatch. Huh? That's the natural evolution of the hominid on your planet. And had they not tinkered with you, you would all be Sasquatch. <laughs> you understand? Yes, I do. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, by the way, had they not tinkered with you, you also would not have evolved the concept of religion in the way that you did. You would simply have, as you're rediscovering, a concept of a natural relationship to creation rather than intermediaries. It was because many of them made you believe they were gods and allowed you to worship them that the entire basis of religion was created on your planet. You wouldn't have it if it wasn't for their existence in your lives back then, about 500, 300,000 years ago. Yes, it is. And again, we're talking holographic history because there are many versions of this. You are evolving to a point where you will have a version that will serve you in the best possible way, which is one of the reasons why when open contact actually does occur, one of the gifts you will be given is what you might think of as your true history on Earth. All of it. All the missing pieces. Everything. And then you will get to decide which parts you relate to and how you can allow yourself to be the people that you prefer to be that would be representative of the kind of people that would have been created by the true history that is in alignment with who you truly are. That's what we mean by true history. Not that there is only one history that is true, but that it is the history that is true for who you prefer to be vibrationally. Does this make sense? Yes. yes. All right. Is there a way that we can really remember our 
selves, our real selves. Yes. That's why we give you the formula. That's what happens. It all boils down to a few simple instructions. Because when you follow the instructions of acting on your passion to the best you can, with no assumption, no insistence on the outcome, and you remain in a positive state no matter what's happening, what happens? You raise your frequency. When you raise your frequency, what happens? You become a more sensitive antenna to higher frequency communication and information and intelligence. When you become a better receiver of that information, what happens? You expand your consciousness. When you expand your consciousness, what happens? You know yourself more deeply, more fully, more truly. It all works together. That's why we give you the instruction manual. Almost Every single question most of you ask us is contained in that instruction manual. By doing it, you will be more of yourself. And when you are more of yourself, you will know more of yourself. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Why do we keep forgetting our power so quickly, so easily? Because you have been trained to. Because you have been trained to buy into fear-based beliefs, that say you are not worthy, you are not deserving, you are not powerful, you are not confident, you are not trusting, you are not connected, you are out of control. Yes? These are the things that you are taught on your planet. When you grow up in your society, from your parents, your friends, your schooling. But when you become an adult, you begin to realize, hey, I was spoon-fed something that I can't digest anymore. That's not me. I needed to believe it was me for a while because other people made me believe that if I didn't believe that, they wouldn't take care of me. They wouldn't like me. I wouldn't survive. But now, you're an adult. You can handle survival on your own. You can thrive. You need to find out who you really are. You need to let go of the things that are no longer you, that supported you up to a point, but which you no longer need. You're carrying around, most of you, other people's belief systems that have nothing to do with you. Other people's baggage, so to speak. Your baggage weighs nothing. If you feel held back, it means you're carrying around someone else's baggage. Drop it. Find out what those beliefs are that are out of alignment with who you truly are, who you prefer to be. And when you bring those fear-based, negative-oriented beliefs to the light of your consciousness from your unconscious mind, and really see what they say, the first thing you will notice is, more often than not, they will appear illogical, nonsensical, when you really examine what they say. You will see right through them as a lie. And therefore, as soon as a belief appears to you to be nonsensical, it's gone. That's the end of the process of letting it go, not the beginning. Because you don't hold on to anything that appears nonsensical. If you do hold on to the belief, that means there is another belief that is making that belief appear to make sense. You have to find out what that belief is and keep digging and digging and digging until you come down to the fundamental, foundational belief that is holding all the other ones together. And as soon as you crack that fundamental negative belief, all the other ones will collapse. But sometimes a negative belief, a fundamental one, because it is attempting to perpetuate itself, like all beliefs are made to do, may hide under other beliefs, allow you to think, oh, look, I discovered that negative belief, it's gone, now everything will be different. But you see that it's not. You keep acting the same way, keep behaving the same way, keep feeling the same way, keep thinking the same way, keep having the same kind of negative experiences. That simply means you haven't found the fundamental negative belief. Keep digging. Once you find that and see that it makes no sense and truly let that one go, then everything changes, everything shifts. 
Agreed. But Agreed. you will find out, generally speaking, even though there may be very many specific ways in which this can be expressed in your life, you will usually find out that the fundamental negative belief is some variation of I'm not worthy. And yet, you exist. How could it be that you exist if you're not worthy of existence? Do you believe creation makes a mistake? It doesn't. Nothing is pointless within existence. It exists for a reason. So if you exist, just to put it in colloquial language, existence must need you to exist in order for it to be complete unto itself. Because if it really didn't need you, you wouldn't exist. Therefore, you are worthy by the fact that you exist, and you don't need another reason to be worthy. If you start to believe that you are unworthy, and keep believing that you are unworthy, you are arguing with creation about your worth. You will never, ever win that argument. Ever. Because you cannot cease to exist. You may change form, but you, the you that is you, the reflection of all that is, that is your perspective, your unique consciousness, cannot cease to exist. Why? Because, by definition, there's nowhere for you to go. Non-existence, by definition, doesn't exist. Think about it. That's the quality of non-existence, to not exist. It doesn't exist. That's its quality. So if you exist, you can't become non-existent because non-existence doesn't exist. There's nowhere for you to go. So you are worthy because you exist. Is this making some sense to you? <laughs> I'm feeling all of these things. I feel these, almost like my, I'm a hive and the hive is splitting in some way. And so I'm just going the right direction and if you're being you, I, I yes. I'm definitely being me for the first time in my life. Just me, not carrying other people's baggage, but still on the same journey. Well, yes, on the journey of being you. You see, that's actually your purpose in life, all of you, to be you as fully as you can be. You may express that purpose in a number of ways, but those are the expressions of your purpose. Your purpose is to be you. That's it. Simple. Don't overthink it. Don't overcomplicate it. Just be you. Even though most of you have been taught to do this, the hardest thing to do is to be someone you're not. The easiest thing is to be you. All the pain, all the struggle, all the strife, all the difficulty comes from trying to be someone you're not. I would like to know what happens to a, to a fetus, a child, when it all is right. aborted. First of all, understand that the spirit, the soul, cannot really fully connect to the body for 49 days. That is the time at which the pineal gland forms, and once the pineal gland forms, then the idea of the expression of consciousness can come through the body. You understand? Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, understand that the spirit, that being that was representative of your child, knew what your decision would be and only wanted to stick its toe in the water of physical reality. Okay. You understand? I do. Nothing happens by accident. It's an orchestration. That being still exists, still around you, still loves you, still perfectly viable, knew that it didn't necessarily want a full physical life, knew that it might just want to give you an opportunity to go through this process, and so in that sense chose to help you experience whatever it is you are experiencing in this examination. All spirits, all beings are eternal, indestructible. You understand? Yes. The idea of physical reality is a temporary construct. That being is perfectly fine. You follow me? His definition of abundance is the ability to do what you need to do when you need to do it, period.
And that opens it very wide for all different forms of abundance to come in. Because abundance on this planet is represented not only by things like money, but it's represented by synchronicity, it's represented by trade, it's represented by being given a gift, it's even represented by imagination. Because when you use your imagination, it opens up different ideas and different paths you could take that may not require what you thought you needed before. So there are many forms of abundance that allow you to continue to act on your excitement by supporting you in whatever way and even in whatever combination of ways that they need to. Sometimes you might need a little bit of money. If that's all that comes, then that means the rest of the abundance can come in other forms. Because if you get in life what you need, you will be fulfilled. Sometimes your wants and needs can coincide, but you don't always know when. And in many cases, what people want is not what they need, and it's not what makes them happy. What you need will be given to you through synchronicity and will always fulfill you. Mermaids, yes or no? Longer answer than you may okay. say. Okay, okay, darn. <laughs> There have been some genetic creations that would be similar to that in Atlantean times that may have given rise to some of those legends. In terms of them existing physically as a species on your Earth, no, but they are part of the nature world that again is a slightly altered, shifted vibrational reality to yours that sometimes overlaps in your reality and therefore sometimes people who are sensitive to it can sometimes perceive those kinds of beings, but they don't exist in your normal physical reality. All right, all right. Dragons? Similar idea. Oh, Again, dragons. they are beings that are of a higher dimensional level that you can interact with, but they exist between the planes of dimensions. They are never presenting themselves in your physical reality as the dragon that you think they do. They look quite different when they come into your reality. But the idea is, is that you perceive them in the way that you do when they're in their own natural state in between the dimensions. But they are higher levels of wisdom. Megalodon. Well, that exists. It's a giant shark. Does it exist right now? Several do. Yes! In the very depths of your oceans. Awesome. Okay. And a few other things you haven't found yet. Oh, cool. Way cool. How about a hollow earth? No. Not okay. physically. Okay. Again, people that may have, without intending to, cross through different dimensional vortices may find themselves in a reality that because of their understanding of physical reality, they think actually physically is inside the earth when in fact they're no longer on the earth anywhere at all. Huh. Really? So they just make the assumption when they come back through that particular portal that they've actually physically been inside the earth and they haven't, they've been somewhere else. Um. Okay, so I have a project that I've been working on. It involves telepathy. Telepathy. Yes, telepathy. And I've reached, um, I kind of had a creative block or, or a little bit of trouble linking things together. All right, well, you do understand what telepathy is, yes? How it works? Yes. In a, in a well, explain it to us okay. then, please. I'd feel, I'd feel more comfortable if you explained it. So you don't understand. Maybe not. We'll see All after. Right. Yeah. Again, people on your planet, many of them, use this outdated, old-fashioned idea that telepathy and telepathy means you are reading someone else's mind. You are never reading someone else's mind. Ever. Telepathy, and why we say telempathy, as being more precise, is because you get on a similar wavelength a similar frequency to someone else, and then you automatically, by being on that frequency, have the same thoughts at the same time, synchronistically. So the mind you're reading is your own. It just happens to be exactly the same thing that someone else is thinking because you're on the same wavelength. That's how telepathy works. You have to, in a sense, be in love with them, in alignment with them, or have a great, overpowering need to be on that frequency and know what they're thinking. But you're only reading your own mind. You're not reading theirs. So is it possible to send and transmit information between two people? Do you not see that all the time with people who are in yeah. love with each other? Because again, they're having the same thoughts at the same time. So the way it works mechanically is that someone gets into a certain frequency when they're thinking a certain thing, 
the other person in the relationship that loves them in one way, shape, or form is willing to be open to adjust their frequency on an ongoing basis here and there to match the vibration the other person is giving off, and thus they will have the same thoughts, thus having received what the other person was sending. Can it be done with people that don't know each other? Yes. As long as they hit the same basic frequency, yes, of course. So there are people who are sensitive enough to be open enough and allow their frequency to fluctuate and adjust enough to tap into, to scan and tap into other frequencies of other people and then go, oh, all right, I'll match that one. And then they will know what that person is thinking and perhaps vice versa. Okay, Even so though the other person may not know where that thought is coming from. So how can I get past the mental blocks that I have when working to work on this project to keep it? To, well, what is the project? So it's, it's, a, it's an app that involves telepathy, peer-to-peer -peer interaction with people where one, per, one person broadcasts the, the image while the other person has a several... All images. right, but again, you're doing this in a way that may not necessarily always produce the result that you seek because you're leaving the emotional component out of it. And you're also yeah. not following the idea that there are conditions or what I will call rules of psychic functioning. For example, one of them is what you call typically for another reason, the rules of similars. I will give you an example. In some old-fashioned ways of testing for psychic abilities, you have people that have certain kinds of images or cards in front of them that they want the so-called psychic or telepath to read without looking at them. Yes? You know what I'm saying? Yes. But the idea is, is let's say that the person holding the card is holding an ace of spades. To them, energetically, symbolically, the ace of spades may represent a winning card. What the other person who may be capable of adjusting their vibration to match the tester's vibration may pick up on is not the image of the ace, but the energy, the winning card. Now, maybe in the telepaths or psychics past, they were playing a game and the winning card for them might have been the queen of hearts. So they might go, winning card, queen of hearts. The tester will go, no, you failed, when in fact, they succeeded. Because what they did is they went off the idea that the vibration of the ace to the tester is the same as the vibration of the queen to the reader. So they actually did match the vibration, but the symbol was different for what that represents. So you have to deal with an interpretation of symbols between different people. Another rule or condition of psychic functioning and telepathy is simply called the path of least resistance. So in other words, if somebody says, how much change do I have in my pocket, O oh psychic one? The psychic really more sensibly would say, well, information takes the path of least resistance. Why would I need to project my mind into the ethers and find exactly where the change in your pocket is and count it out when all you need to do is reach into your pocket and count it? Because that's the path of least resistance. Because you already know what's there. So the fact that the tester already knows the answer can short circuit the psychic's ability to get it because there's no reason for the psychic to get it because the answer is already known to the tester. So there are many different conditions and so-called rules of psychic functioning that many people on your planet don't understand. And again, one of the things that they make the biggest error about is attempting to remove the emotional component from these kinds of tests because as you observe in life, most telepathy and psychic functioning happens on a spur of the moment spontaneous basis because there is a great deal of identification or love involved or there's a great need to need to know the information which in a sense is the same kind of energy. This is how it works and you have to understand how these things work in order to have an accurate test. So most of the testing actually has to happen in the laboratory of life rather than being restricted down to a sterile environment that may not create the vibrations of similarity that you're looking for to get the result that you seek. 
unless you can design an app that allows people to entrain themselves to be more open to matching the vibrations empathically of other people. And then it might actually have some success. Does that help? It, yeah, it does a little bit. Oh, all right. So. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions on how to help empathic help it empathically? Like I can't you... give you the technology. Okay. You just have to figure it out. All right. This was an idea that came to me. It, it, I woke me up one night and I was like, write this down, do it. And then so I All right. started me on that path. And that's fine. And if the so-called app that you're creating can get people into an excited state about experiencing telepathy, the fact that it gets them into an excited state may actually be what causes the resonance to exist within them that will tap into someone else's excited state about the same thing. And so people participating with your app who are both excited about the potential of what it could create in creating the excitement may actually create the linkage. You follow? Yes. All right. Does that help? It does. All right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bashar is not the entity's name. In their reality, they are telepathic with each other. They don't need names, but he knew we needed to call him something. I am half Irish and half Syrian. My father's side is Middle Eastern. It is a Middle Eastern word. I didn't speak the language. I still don't speak the language. And I actually had to be told two or three years after I started channeling when somebody did speak the language, they came up to me and said, do you understand what Bashar means? And I said, no, I have no idea. He said, it actually is a Syrian word. It means messenger or bringer of good news. So I said, okay, I get it. He had to choose something out of my background somewhere that is at least representative of what he's doing and allows us to give him a name, even though it's not literally his name. And this is part of kind of these breadcrumbs that he sort of drops for me throughout my life that are a puzzle that is just personally for me to pull together, but at least it allows us to identify with him in some way, shape, or form and allow him to have a normal back and forth. Did the Anunnaki fully leave this planet? As far as I know, they were recalled because what they did, as in my understanding, as Bashar has explained it, what they did, they shouldn't have done. They weren't supposed to genetically engineer the native species at all. Um, and therefore, by having done that to aid and assist them in their work, uh, I think my understanding of the story is that they were actually recalled. And then the rest of the Anunnaki had to sort of guide us for a while to make sure we could sort of survive on our own. And that's where all the ancient stories of the gods come in that are intervening, you know, with humanity and all that kind of stuff. Us the giants more. too? That's more the idea of the early Anunnaki actually mating with human women, creating the demigods and all of that kind of stuff. So again, not something they probably should have done. And we're obviously part of them. If that whole story holds water, we're part Anunnaki. That's why our genetics are what they are, uh, why things could be very confused here for us, why there's such a mix of people. So the story isn't complete yet, but so far, that's what we've been told from Bashar. What is the link with the Anunnaki and the Egyptians? Is there any link there? There may be. It's more, that's more recent. The Anunnaki were hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, the idea, though, that they spawned once humanity was kind of guided to a certain point, it spawned advanced civilizations like what we call Lemuria and Atlantis. And I think it's more the advanced civilization of Atlantis that affected the early Egyptian civilization and started giving them the knowledge they needed to build pyramids and all that kind of stuff that are still very advanced today until the knowledge was lost. But, you know, the destruction of Atlantis and all that caused a lot of knowledge to be lost over time. So we're only just kind of recapturing some of that now. I'm curious about the correlation between our level of consciousness and the ability to hold information and the awareness of how the pyramids were built and rediscovering this information. Is that is it more of sort of like a parallel 
meeting place that happens with the technology and consciousness or is yes yeah yeah i think bashar has said you know the level of technology that exists in any civilization is a marker to some degree of the level of their consciousness because if your consciousness doesn't arrive at a certain level you can't even imagine how to build certain things yeah. how to do things now the atlanteans had a very high level of consciousness at a certain point in their history as i understand it and they achieved a lot of things but they also achieved a lot of things that are different than the way we've achieved sure. certain things so we have yet to learn how they did certain things although we have hints that they understood things about light about sound vibration that allowed them to achieve a lot of interesting things and we just have learned to do things differently you know we have atomic power I don't think they had atomic power, but they had vibrational power. Mm -hmm. They had an understanding of crystalline light power, you know, and things like that. So, you know, it's just a matter of how each civilization expresses what their consciousness does. The problem is that our consciousness is also compartmentalized. So we can have certain advances in technology and not necessarily be so advanced spiritually or morally, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to catch up, I think to the idea that that all has to be balanced out before we can really achieve a quantum leap to the next level of understanding. I want to go both sides of that. So first off, what is it that takes a civilization out? Is there actual um, proactive entities that make sure that a planet stays calm enough? Or is this like, or is it cataclysm? Is it astral? Well, yeah, I mean, from Bashar's point of view, that's what wiped out Atlantis finally was a comet hit the sea and tsunamis everywhere. And that to me is what he says is that's the biblical flood that we're recounting is the fact that an, a comet hit the ocean and there were floods that happened, widespread floods that happened from that. And it wiped out the last vestiges of Atlantis. But again, Earth is a place of cycles. There are cataclysms that happen in this reality that have taken out many different civilizations. I think scientists are beginning to discover that more than a few civilizations have been wiped out on this planet by a variety of catastrophes, including meteorites. So, you know, it's like begin again, begin again, begin again. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of pyramids around the world and temples were built is we're going to lose this information from time to time because that's just the nature of being on Earth. So let's build things that are almost indestructible that contain all the information that people will need to rediscover so they don't have to start from scratch. They just have to be smart enough to understand that this is a special structure and that there's something they can learn from it. And we have discovered, obviously, there's advanced mathematics in the Great Pyramid and other temples and pyramids around the world. And I think they were all constructed around the same time before the destruction of Atlantis, because I think some people knew it was coming again because these well, things were in cycles you know so you say that and i thought to myself what would i do if i thought that there was going to be some kind of fallout and i thought to myself where would i go if that happened what would i do and it'd be like you just go in our earth mm -hmm. like where else do you go if you can't get off the planet you go inside did right. and that's you exactly, do that yeah that's exactly what happened with the grays they went underground and that's why they mutated into the form that they're in. It's why they have such large eyes. <laughs> they had to see in the dark. So even though they had lighting, it's very sparse because again, they were at a point where their civilization had pretty much collapsed in scrounging together whatever advancement they had was the last ditch effort to shift to another reality to save themselves. So they mutated in the way that they did by going underground. Are they still there? No, 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 that's long gone in their reality i mean again everything exists at the same time but linearly yeah. speaking, no that's over and done with for them because now they're here and they're creating the hybrids and there may not be that many grays left in fact at this time frame so being here being on earth on the surface or in a ship nearby oh, in ships on mostly. the moon yeah bases underground under ocean on the moon bases like that things like that from where they can operate with impunity um, but, you know, we were, according to the stories, offered 
a lot of this technology, not necessarily from the greys, but from other species back in the 50s, and we refused, again, out of fear. So, you know, they're doing what they can behind the scenes to save themselves and hopefully save us from mm. going down the same path. But <clears throat> there's a lot of paranoia and a lot of fear to overcome in the powers that be because they don't want to lose what they see as their power, even though it's not really an expression of power. Um, but, you know, it's starting to come out. The, the cracks are showing. Information is leaking out. And a lot of people I've heard on the inside are trying to get that information out as well because they no longer believe it's really to our benefit to keep all of this hidden. Inside? When you say inside, who is it you're referring to? Inside the clandestine organizations that are privy to the information that we have crashed craft, we have alien bodies that know what's going on with you know all of that. I think there's a larger number every day of people on the inside that are talking there was just a Senate hearing recently by someone that was from the inside that said, hey, this is what's actually happening, folks. So you're seeing that more and more. I think people are refusing to keep this a secret because they know it's not to our benefit any longer to do that. It may have been a good thing to do just after World War II when everyone was really scared, but it's gone on for too long just because people are trying to do power grabs and stuff like that. It's no longer to our benefit, I think, to keep this a secret. Other star systems like the Anunnaki and Syrians able to visit Earth without damaging their physical bodies. Do their planets have oxygen, water, etc., like Earth? Yes. They wouldn't necessarily have landed on your planet if they didn't have the ability to either adapt or survive in the environment as it is, or bring protective equipment with them, just like you do when you visit your moon. So the idea, again, is <clears throat> it's not that difficult. They're close enough. Remember, you are genetically connected to the Anunnaki. Therefore, in a sense, you are very much like them. So yes, they were oxygen breathing, or well, atmosphere breathing in the way that your atmosphere is constructed similar enough that they could adapt just as you could adapt to certain planets like ours with a little time so the idea is there are many that can adapt to your atmosphere those that can't would bring their protective equipment with them to be able to survive on the surface so how did the early um contactees um in our history handle the vi higher vibration of the ets they were in contact with who said that all of the ETs they were in contact with had higher vibrations to the point where they couldn't handle it. They're making an assumption. When we talk about the idea of not being able to handle our frequency or the frequency of some other ET races, that doesn't necessarily generally apply across the board to every single ET race. Humanity has made some strides in its evolution, making you more vibrationally compatible to some ET races especially those that may be your distant cousins <clears throat> and so on and so forth. Plus, there may be some ETs that are willing to adapt their frequencies to your reality in order to interact with you. And again, remember, we have often said that some of these encounters don't take place in what you consider to be your normal reality. You may actually be having these encounters in a slightly shifted vibrational reality that is germane and vibrationally compatible with both humans and the ETs. So never assume that things are just normal, like they're landing on your planet in your reality, interacting with you in your vibrational state. You may be slightly shifted and not even know it. But nevertheless, it doesn't mean that all ETs are vibrating at a frequency that is something beyond what you can handle if you make well, even the slightest upgrade in your frequency. Like, what would you assess Pleiadian frequency at? Pleiadian frequency is higher than yours, but not out of reach. So again, they may shift the vibration into a different reality that's vibrationally compatible with both of you in that reality. Again, it may not be happening in what you consider to be your physical reality, even though it may seem so. But they're not that far beyond you. Many of you could make the shift into their vibration, and many of you have made the shift into their vibratory frequency. So the idea is simply to recognize that you've come a long way. There are many that are in a 
shall we say, shamanistic way, able to match their frequencies. Love yourself unconditionally, and you won't be that far away from the frequency that they experience for themselves. I know it's interesting that the way that we prepare for contact is to let go of our negative beliefs, which keep our frequency low. Yes. Very interesting. And um, what about the hybrid children? Like what frequency range would you say they will be the ones that come here? Some of them may be able to lower and raise their frequency in a way that would make them slightly more vibrationally compatible with some humans. But for a while, it will take some time to adapt to your reality and some time for humanity to adapt to them. But on average, most of them will not necessarily go lower than 180,000 cycles per second. And most of them will average somewhere in the mid 200,000 range, at least. And the majority of the people on our planet currently are below 100,000? Correct. Okay. But those of us that are exploring this path of transformation and letting go of negative energies and things like that, we rise that, above that. what range is that generally? On average, the people that are willing to open up and explore the idea and expand the idea of their consciousness, willing to let go of fear-based and negative belief systems, <clears throat> willing to express being of service to all and unconditional love as best as possible, can certainly at least average 150,000 cycles per second to 190,000 cycles per second. So there is an overlap there between just, the hybrid children and humanity. And just so that for those that may not be familiar with this, 333,000 cycles per second is the transformation from physical to non-physical yes. energy, right? Yes. And so that gives you an idea that, and the Sasani are running close to 333,000 cycles per second, right? Close. We operate only in the 300,000s and go up and down according to what we need to go up and down for, for a variety of reasons. But yes, the transition from physical to non-physical reality is 333,000 cycles per second. Although your scientists don't yet understand what it is that that exactly measures. So the Anunnaki who created the Homo sapien that sapien. went against their um, rules, so to speak. What frequency range were those beings? They were operating somewhere around the 100,000, 120,000, 130,000 vibrations per second range. So it also shows how you can make great advances technologically, but not necessarily have a high frequency to a point, right? As witnessed by what happened with the beings, the parallel reality humans that mutated into the greys. Yes, they had a very advanced technology, but their spirituality was lacking. What, what frequency range were they functioning at? In the midst of the idea of the destruction of their world, they were only operating somewhere around 60 to 70,000 cycles per second. Gosh, it's just amazing. But at the same time, you've said that we really don't have to be concerned about negative ETs because their frequency range would not be compatible with ours in some way or something. Correct. You would have to match that frequency for yourself to have any interaction awareness at all. And even the idea of interactional awareness actually comes with the idea of raising your frequency. Because remember, negative energy segregates and separates and divides, whereas higher frequencies integrate. So most of the ETs that we're interacting with then would be higher frequency ETs, yes? High enough that they pose no threat to you. I see. Even though there may be misunderstandings, even though they may have very different ways of interacting, Nothing that you're interacting with as humans on Earth are actually being exposed to what you would actually literally call negative extraterrestrials. You are simply unaware of them. Basically, are there any beings who vibrate millions or even billions of cycles per second? And if so, what are they like? Well, they would mostly be non-physical in different dimensions of reality beyond sometimes even what you can imagine. Of course, the idea in general of what you would call God, goddess, all that is, would be operating at an infinite frequency. Oh, and so as far as the hybridization agenda goes, why is the hybridization agenda in our best interest? 
because it's part of Earth's evolutionary path that you've all chosen to become the sixth hybrid race, to advance yourself in a variety of ways that will open up access to the galaxies of the universe to you. This is the way you're improving yourself. This is the way you're reclaiming the genetics that the Anunnaki shut down within you when they created Homo sapiens. By injecting the idea of other genetics <clears throat> within yourself, you supersede what the Anunnaki did, overcome and overwhelm it, and expand your energy field to the high frequencies that will allow you to expand from the earth into the galaxy.